Welcome to the Outdoor Art Club webinar. Today, we're going to talk about wild care all around us. Our speaker today is Allison Hermans. She's been with wild care for 19 years. And for the past 14, she's been director of communications, handling all the PR and public relations, uh, media, outreach programs for the organization. She takes care of the website and the newsletter and also writes extensively about wildlife and the animals who are injured or orphaned who are admitted to the wild, wild care wildlife hospital. In her uh, volunteer capacity, she is on the squirrel and skunk rescue teams, and also is part of the Raptor Reunite team. In her spare time, she enjoys travel, bird watching, and outdoor motorcycling. After her presentation, she will answer questions that you have about animals and how to live well with wildlife in your own neighborhood. If you have a question, go to the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen and enter it there at any time during the program. So now let's welcome Allison. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here today. I'm thrilled for this opportunity to speak to the Outdoor Art Club. You ladies are, your, your, all of your members are wonderful and such a great opportunity to interact with another group in Marin County and thrilled to be speaking to all of our webinar participants as well. I'm gonna share my screen here really quickly and get started with my presentation. So I, it, I'd be curious how many of our participants are familiar with wild care. When we do this in, in person, I can always get a show of hands. But wild care is a wildlife hospital and nature education and wildlife advocacy organization. We're located in downtown San Rafael, right behind the baseball diamond, if you know where that is. And we have an amazing group of programs that all work together with the goal of helping people live well with wildlife. And that is actually the focus of my presentation today. We're gonna to talk about animals. We're gonna talk about how we care for them in the wildlife hospital. And we're going to talk about how we can uh, make a difference in our, in our cohabitation with our wildlife neighbors. Uh, let's see, I just hit the screen advance and it didn't do anything yet. Hang on one second, there we go. So just a little bit of quick history about the organization because Wild Care has been part of the Marin community for so many years. We actually have been at our current location. We're still at our current location in downtown San Rafael since the 50s when the location served as a natural history museum. It was the Marin Junior History Museum and then the Louise A. Boyd Natural Science Museum both of which really catered to this idea of teaching nature education, introducing children and, and people of all ages to the joys of nature and the environment and of animals. In 1974, we became the California Center for Wildlife. It's actually the Marin Center for Wildlife and then California Center for Wildlife. And that was one of the very first wildlife hospitals in the entire United States. And what happened is that as the Bay Areas expanded, as more and more people started moving into Marin especially, you had a uh, more and more people finding injured and orphaned animals. You know, baby squirrel fell out of the tree and people would bring those animals to the Natural History Museum because at least the people there could tell you what kind of animal it was, but there wasn't any facility to provide care for those animals until the mid seventies when we opened a wildlife hospital in our location. And interestingly, the uh, community of wildlife care centers in the Bay Area is just incredible. We have such incredible partners and the first seals and sea lions that were treated by the people that started the Marine Mammal Center were actually cared for at our facility and swam in the pool where our pelicans now are. So a little bit of history there. We did have a bear at one point. Someone had found the bear, we named him Teddy, found the bear when he was a young bear and had decided he would make a good pet. 
I think we can all agree that mer bears probably make terrible pets. And when he grew into a full-sized brown, a uh, black bear, then it was realized they realized that he was too tame to be released, and he became an ambassador animal. And that was a long time ago. I think that would say. I think he passed away in the 1980s, late 1980s. But uh, some fun history there. So in 1994, the California Center for Wildlife merged with the Terwilliger Nature Education Center and became Wild Care under our current name. And I assume many people in my audience are aware of Elizabeth Terwilliger. She was an absolute force of nature, both literally, literally and figuratively, an incredible lady. She was really one of the first people that realized that children especially are going to become more excited about nature and the environment if they know about it and if they explore it and have the opportunity to learn about it. And she had a famous saying that was, teach children to love nature, people take care of what they love. And that's really true. And she had an amazing ability to teach using all five senses. She had some wonderful mnemonics. If you ever want to know the difference between a hawk and a vulture when they're flying, if you see a bunch of birds circling in the air, if the wings are flat out, it's a hawk. If the wings are in a V, it's a vulture. And so you can always remember that V is for vulture. And that's a, a good example of some of Mrs. T's wonderful mnemonics to teach about the natural world and wild, wild Care's nature education programs still continue her wonderful tradition of using the senses and really immersing kids in the, in the, just in the natural world to develop that love and that stewardship of the environment. So we became Wild Care then in 1994. And over the years, we have generally treated between 3,000 and 4,000 ill, injured, and orphaned wild animals in our wildlife hospital. At this point, when it's not COVID, it's a little more complicated with COVID, but when it's not COVID, we reach over 35,000 children and adults in the Bay Area with our fabulous Terwilliger Nature Education um, programs. We answer thousands, over 15, uh, 14, 15,000 of calls on our Living with Wildlife hotline, and that number is there. You're going to see that a few other times during the presentation. Mark it down, because if you have a question about wildlife, you can call us. Uh, we have helped hundreds of homeowners work, live better with wildlife, and the organization is over 80% funded by individual donations. We really don't have a lot of support um, incoming from any sort of governmental organization. A lot of people think that we're a, a governmental piece and that, that that's the role we have in the community, but one of the things I love about wild care is that we al are almost entirely supported by individual donations. So keep that in mind when you find an injured and orphaned animal. But let's talk about our wildlife neighbors. I think Wild Care is an organization, again, I've worked there almost 20 years. And, and the reason I work there is, is because it's an amazing place. And I really, really genuinely strongly believe in the mission that Wild Care has, which is to teach people to live well with wildlife. So we're gonna meet some of the animals that are in the wildlife hospital and talk about some of the things that people deal with in terms of wildlife. The title of this program, of course, was Friend or Foe, and, and we consider all of them friends, and I'm very much hoping that at the end of this presentation, you will also see that our wildlife neighbors are friends, so hopefully we can do that. We'll work on a little bit of identification, how to tell who's who when you're out hiking around. We'll talk about how we care for them in the wildlife hospital, and we'll also talk about how to live well with the wildlife that share your environment. So we're going to start with an animal that I feel like has no controversy around it, these amazing raptors. So we have a lot of raptors that come through Marin County. During the migration time, you find that the majority of hawks that, that commute, I was going to say, migrate on the West Coast, come down the edge of California, right? Point Reyes is the westernmost point of the lower 48 states. And it is really that line along the coast that the raptors tend to follow when they're migrating. And, and some of the raptors, I mean, the Swainson's hawk does this unbelievable migration from way up north all the way down to Argentina, just an incredible trip that those birds take. So a lot of raptors fly through during migration, and we also have a lot of raptors that just live here year round. It may not be the same bird, but it, you have a lot of these species. The red-tailed hawk, of course, is one that you'll see a lot. That's one of those straight out for a hawk birds that you'll see. I find it interesting. Oh, the word for when you see birds circling vultures and hawks together. 
it's called kettling. It's called a kettle. So when you see a kettle of birds and the wings are straight out, that's very often going to be a red-tailed hawk. And the red tail is easy to identify because of the red tail, yes, but that only develops when the bird is fully mature. But you can always tell a red tail because of the pelagic patches from the underside. It's a light colored belly. And then you'll see these dark patches basically right here on the shoulder of the bird. Those are the pelagic patches. And that's one of the easy ways to tell that that is a red tail. But we admit the red tails into the wildlife hospital. Often during the fall migration, we'll get young red tails coming in that are doing their first migration. And let me tell you, migration is hard. That's a lot of flying. And if you're not really good at hunting yet, it can be really challenging to keep your weight up and be able to continue your migration. And so we get a lot of birds coming in emaciated during the late fall and into the early winter because they are migrating and don't are not yet able to keep themselves fully fed. So we'll, we'll see a lot of those animals come in and, and we have an emaciation protocol in the wildlife hospital and we are able to treat them and release them. And of course, that's the goal of everything that wild care does in the wildlife hospital is to admit injured, orphaned, and ill wild animals with an absolute minimum and with an absolute minimum of intervention, but with state-of-the-art, world-class medical care, get them rehabilitated and then back out into the wild as quickly as possible. That is always our goal is to get these animals back out into the wild. And I always like to point out that if you were to find an injured raptor on the ground, Absolutely call wild care. That number 415-456-SAVE is a good one to have in your phone, but it's also, uh, if you need to rescue that animal, you want to pay attention to the beak because the beak is very sharp, but really the main thing you want to pay attention to when you're dealing with a raptor are those talons, and those talons are very, very sharp and actually go through a thick glove, so we wear heavy welding gloves when we deal with the very large raptors. And this, of course, is a great horned owl. Uh, to tell a great horned owl, they're hard to see, of course, because owls are most active at night. But to tell a great horned owl, you're going to listen for that telltale sound. We associate that sound with a lot of different owls because Disney taught us that's what they all say, but that's not true. Actually, the great horned owl is the one that says, Hoo-hoo. and if you listen carefully, especially this time of year, we're in January right now, if you listen carefully, you might hear a pair having a little duet and you will hear the adult male and he'll say, Hoo-hoo. and then you will hear the adult female. And although she is bigger, and this is true of many raptor species that the female is significantly larger than the male. Although she's a bigger bird, she has a slightly higher voice. So you'll hear hoo-hoo and you'll hear them coming back before, between two trees. And that means they are getting ready to mate and build a nest and have their young. And in the wildlife hospital, some of the very first raptors that we admit are the great horned owls that come in. Wonderful fluffy babies, just unbelievably cool. Some of the other raptors that we treat are your Western screech owls and your barn owls. The barn owls are beautiful, beautiful birds once they're in their full adult proof plumage, but they're just kind of funny looking when they're babies. Look at those funny little naked faces. We think about owls as having a big round face, a big round head, and of course they do have that, but most of that is feathers. So looking at those baby barn owls, you can kind of see what the head looks like underneath. Always really interesting. In the wildlife hospital, of course, you have to be careful of all of the animals because none of them want to be in care, none of them want to be in captivity, and none of them want anything to do with humans. And of course, our goal during the entire treatment process is to make sure that they don't become accustomed to humans because an animal, a wild animal that is accustomed to humans is a wild animal that's not going to survive. So you have to be very careful with all of the animals, but you would think that we'd go back to our great horned owl friend here. You would think that he would be the one that the wildlife staff would be the most concerned about. And certainly he can wreak a lot of habit if, if, he, if he gets his talons through those gloves. But if you want ferocity, you have to look for those Western screech owls. They're only about this big. They're very, very small, but they are ferocious. If you have to open up the enclosure to get the screech owl, you have to give him medication or maybe it's released it and he has to go into a box to be returned back to his home territory. And he will lean back on his tail and he will show you those talons and he will clack that beak and he will blink those eyes like weird asymmetry and he he just and it, it startles you they're 
very, very ferocious. They're the, the little Napoleons of the owl world, but uh, they're incredible. And, and I mean, one of the reasons that I have been at Wild Care for almost 20 years is because I get to see these animals and I get to see them in care and I get to see them recovering. And the best thing in the whole world is that day when you see an animal that came in emaciated and sick and injured and, and see that animal be able to fly or run back to uh, his freedom, back to his home. And uh, we release them back where they came from. So just an amazing opportunity. Uh, we have a number of programs at Wild Care. And of course, one of the things that I love about Wild Care's programs is that they all work together to help people live well with wildlife. And it's a full cycle of programs that help people navigate the boundary where people and animals come into contact with each other. Oh, good. My cat just walked past me. So she doesn't visit us. Um, and so navigating that boundary for humans and wildlife come into contact with each other. And so uh, the Hungry Owl Project is one of our programs. And that program is uh, encouraging people to never, never use rat poisons and to actually use owl boxes. So if you're interested in learning about owl boxes to attract owls to your property, you can visit us at hungryowls.org. That is the website for the Hungry Owl Project. I just realized time is flying. So I'm going to step on it a little bit. Some of the water birds that we treat as well. Wild Care treats about 65% birds because we do treat songbirds, raptors, and water birds, and about and then the other 35% is mammals and reptiles. Um, some of the water birds that we care for. Uh, this is a great egret tangled in fishing line and easily 90 to 95 percent of the wildlife hospital patients that come in come in because of negative interactions with humans or our stuff. Another reason I love wild care is I feel like we are making a real difference for those individual animals that would never have gotten tangled up in fishing line and then tangled up in a tree if, if humans hadn't been around inappropriate leaving our leaving our fishing line around um, one of our education advocacy issues that we always talk about is anytime you have something that has a circle in it, like a plastic circle, like a six pack ring or anything that can get tangled, always, always, always make sure it is fully contained, snipped and wrapped up into a, a sealed garbage, there's my cat again, a sealed garbage container and that it's not floating free in the environment. And because that, that's what happened to this bird, he got tangled up in fishing line, landed in a tree, got himself all snarled up. Uh, this one was actually rescued by a PG&E crew. They were able to bring out their cherry picker tree and cut him down. And after um, being treated for emaciation and, and dehydration and all of the things and some injuries from the, uh, the line being wrapped around his neck, he was able to be released, but very good cautionary tale about making sure that your fishing line is properly contained and any other kind of line as well. Uh, one of the questions that we get at Wild Care a lot is, is which white bird is that? We're lucky in Marin County to have an amazing, actually the Bay Area in general, to have an amazing array of birds to see. And two of the most common ones that you'll see are these beautiful white birds. You have the gray egret and you have the snowy egret. And how do you tell the difference? Well, first of all, size. Obviously, the gray egret is much larger than the snowy egret, but that can be hard to tell because is that a small bird near and a big bird far away or, you know, what is that? So you want to look at the beak. The gray egret has that orange beak. The snowy egret has a black beak. And you want to look at the legs as well and the feet especially. So they both have blackish legs, but you'll see the snowy egret has those wonderful yellow feet. And what I love about him, what he does with those yellow feet is he will put it under some leaves or into the mud where he's stalking for fish and crabs and other things that he eats. And he will raise one little toe up through the muck and he will just move it a little bit. And it probably looks like a delicious treat to a fish. And so the fish comes over to investigate that little toe waving and the egret gets his dinner. So that's how he fishes, one of his methods. But that's a good look at the two different egrets that we have. We also have, of course, the great blue herons, but they're not white, they're, they're gray and they're gray and blue and they're also bigger than that great egret. So fun to see those guys. And now you'll be able to tell the difference, especially with that beak color is a good way to look. We treat a lot of ducklings at Wild Care. We treat about 250 ducklings every year. And they are one of the very first uh, 
animals that our volunteers get to interact with because they're pretty harmless. But let me tell you, as adorable as ducklings are, and they are very cute, they are equally that disgusting. So if you ask the volunteers to clean the duckling pens, it's okay to go in and they, you know, clean the pen and get rid of all of the disgusting stuff. And they put in the water source and they put in the food, all the food for them, some romaine lettuce and a few other things. And then they do put in their the feather duster, which is what you give the babies to snuggle up against, which always makes me a little bit sad. And you put the ducklings back in and everything looks beautiful. And then you turn and you, know, you scratch your head or you talk to somebody and you turn back and that clean brooder that you just completely fixed up is absolutely filthy, covered in poop and feathers and fluff and who knows what. There are few things more able to make a thing dirty than a duckling. But we, of course, love them and it's great to be able to release those guys back to the wild. Ooh, there we go. That worked. Um, but ducklings always make me think of another advocacy issue that wild care is very proactive about, and that is feeding wildlife and in particular feeding ducks. A lot of people like to go and feed the ducks at say the Marin Civic Center Lagoon. And what not everyone realizes is that actually bread is terrible for ducks and geese. Complex carbohydrate, absolutely no nutrition, and it is like feeding your kids Twinkies. And what you don't realize when you're thinking about, oh, I want to go feed the ducks, and you bring your bag of bread over to the Marin Civic Center Lagoon, and you feed all the ducks and geese, and they love it, of course, because it's delicious, and they really are excited about it, and you think to yourself, yay, job well done, go back home. But what you're not thinking about is that every other person that has come to visit those ducks and geese is feeding them the same thing. So you will end up with animals that eat almost nothing but human provided carbohydrates. And just if you only like if you only fed your children Twinkies, they end up with significant health problems. And we'll look at those in just a second, because really this is part of the living with wildlife discussion that we're having during this presentation, the dangers of feeding wildlife. You've probably, if you've been to Tahoe recently, or if you've been to Yellowstone, you've seen a fed bear is a dead bear. And that is really, really true. So you have animals, when they discover that humans provide food, they do not understand that this human provides food, but this human is scared of bears or you know whatever the, whatever animal it is. And there is absolutely no way to teach an animal that it's okay to accept food in some situations. If, if you've offered food, you've taught an animal that human beings provide food. And the fact is that makes the animal approach humans, that makes the animal potentially aggressive, and that means that the animal is probably going to get killed either accidentally or intentionally. So feeding wildlife, whether you're feeding bread to ducks or you're feeding you know, other things to bears, always going to be a really, really poor decision and not helpful to the animals. Back to our friends, the ducks and geese at the Civic Center, they frequently get a condition called angel wing. And angel wing is the result of a, new, uh, a nutritional deficit. And it is when the bird is developing, it's kind of like rickets in children that people used to get because they weren't getting all of the vitamins and minerals they need. These animals eat a very complex diet. They eat a lot of vegetables. They eat a lot of the pond weed and all of that stuff. They also eat the proteins in insects and, and other things that they can catch. So really it's a very, very diet, heavy on vegetables for these animals. And when they've been fed nothing but complex carbohydrates, again, everybody's doing it, you end up with this angel wing. And when it's really bad, it's irreversible, unfortunately, and the birds are not actually able to fly. So really, really reconsider if you think you want to go and feed the birds at the pond. If you really want to do that, and I do get that that's a tradition and a lot of people enjoy doing it, do something like romaine lettuce bringing some chopped up romaine lettuce. They're not going to love it as much as they loved the Cheerios that you brought last week, but they are going to be much healthier because of it. Another thing that feeding wildlife causes is spreading of disease. Of course, that makes sense. You have that aggregation of animals together in a single spot for the feeding. You have that lots of opportunity for them to interact with each other. It's just like COVID, right? You go to the rock concert and everybody's screaming and laughing and you're all gonna catch the same disease, right? So that same thing happens with animals, not at the rock concert, needless to say. Uh, distemper is a very big issue. Always make sure that your pets are fully vaccinated 
native distemper is actually something the wild population generally gets from domestic animals. Can go both ways, obviously, but uh, distemper can be just awful. And we do have distemper in Marin and in the Bay Area in general. And then salmonellosis, which we'll talk about a little bit more as well, which is the salmonella poisoning that birds pass back and forth at bird feeders. Very, very dangerous for them. There's that unnatural population aggregation and that uh, natural balance being disturbed, loss of fear of humans, definitely putting animals in a situation where they're going to get in trouble if they're not properly wary of humans. Creating nuisance wildlife. I, we get calls all the time at Wild Care of people saying, my neighbor feeds the raccoons and now there are too many raccoons and I'm going to trap and kill them. And that happens so often that you will have one person who thinks that feeding is a good idea and is attracting wildlife to the neighborhood and another person who is paying trappers to come and kill the animals. And it's heartbreaking. So you really are by feeding, opening up a window for animals to put themselves in a very, very bad situation. And, and the consequences for humans are not great, of course, because you don't want to have animals that you consider nuisances. Um, you don't want to be dealing with that. But the consequences for the animals, of course, are much, much worse. You can see in our bird down below and also in the raccoon, that's a raccoon skeleton, in the x-ray, you can see the pellets because people will shoot them. I don't want the raccoons in my yard. I'm going to shoot them. I don't know who those people are, but it happens. And the other more common situation is, as I mentioned, people call in trappers. Now, a lot of people think that you can call in a trapper and he will trap that raccoon or skunk and he will take that raccoon or skunk out to a natural habitat and, really, and release him. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Relocation is actually, so moving an animal to another environment is actually illegal in California and for good reason. The few studies that have been done have shown that a huge proportion, like 80% or more of animals that are relocated die within the first month of being there. And that makes sense. If someone picked me up with no money, no cell phone, only the clothes on my back and dropped me in the middle of a city on the other side of the world, yeah, I'm going to not know where to live. I'm not going to know where to get shelter. I'm, I'm not going to know where to get food. And I don't you know, have any money, so I can't get food. I'm going to be prey and you know, a victim for you know, people that already live there. They might not want me there. And that's what happens is that animals have been relocated, get beaten up by the animals that are already there. They don't know where the shelter is. They don't know where the food is. And, and it's a very, very cruel and inhumane way. So it's illegal, that's a good thing. But when it comes down to it, um, the trappers are actually legally required in California to either release the animal within a hundred yards of where they trapped it. So the animal just comes back if you haven't solved that problem or they have to euthanize the animal. So most of the trappers are just euthanizing, even if they tell you that they're not. So feeding wildlife puts these animals in this situation. And I have to say, calling trappers also puts these animals in this situation. So let's look at some ways to prevent these wildlife conflicts and make sure that you don't have to call a trapper. You don't have to pull out the BB gun. There's no excuse for pulling out the BB gun. Um, Number one, as I said, don't feed wildlife. Really, really one of the main ways that you can prevent those conflicts. But the second and the and the really the, the main way is to make you other than not feeding them, is to make your property less attractive to animals than other properties, right? You want to remove the things that are attracting wildlife to your property. And those things are always going to be food, water, or shelter, a place to have a den site. This is the only way to solve a nuisance wildlife problem. You can trap raccoon after raccoon after raccoon, but if you still have a great den site available under your deck, or you still have cat food out every evening, you are always going to get another raccoon. So killing them isn't going to solve the problem. You need to take away what is attracting them. And our wonderful Living with Wildlife hotline, again, 415-456-SAVE at Wildcare, has fabulous advice to help you figure out what is attractive animals to your property and do something about it that means they won't come back, permanently solving that problem without having to trap and kill anyway. anyone. I love this picture by uh, Patrick Donahue. He entered this in Wild Care's photo contest. And this was apparently he walked out, opened up the lid of his compost bin, and there were these three young raccoons in there. They must have sort of toppled in. 
And uh, I think everyone was sort of surprised by that. He ended up leaning over his, uh, the compost bin. The little guys ran out, went straight down the gutter, probably hooked up with mom again. And she's like, uh-huh, told you not to be doing that out to going into the compost bin, that's dangerous. Um, so removing those attractants, number one way. So, and then of course the third thing is learning to appreciate your wild neighbors. What do these animals do for you? Well, let's look at that. Uh, friend or foe? Well, friend, of course. I dare anyone to look at either of these faces and not think that baby skunks and back baby raccoons are absolutely wonderful. I actually took both of these pictures. Again, one of the reasons I stay at Wild Bear. I must admit that the baby, that skunks in general are my favorite local wild animal. They quite literally have one defense mechanism. They have, they don't run, they don't climb, they can bite, but they don't tend to. They have one defense mechanism and it's a doozy, of course, but otherwise they are just these congenial, like just wandering around, bumbling around little animals. They're marvelous. Um, but we're gonna, oh, I was, I was gonna look at the numbers. We treat between 30 and 60 skunks at Wild Care every year and uh, over a hundred raccoons. So we treat a lot of these animals that come in. So let's look at living with raccoons. The first is why should you appreciate your raccoon neighbors? Because your raccoons eat rodents. There have been studies done. There was one big study that was done in the Chicago area where they did a study of raccoon scat. So they were analyzing raccoon droppings. And the vast majority, yeah, there's some garbage in there. Yeah, there's some cat food in there. Yeah, there's a few other things in there. But the vast majority of what raccoons eat is rodents. So here's the thing, if you have raccoons living in your area, you're not going to have a rodent problem. And I actually had a real life experience with this in a house that I was renting. We had a, a rat problem. There were rats in the wires in the crawl space underneath. And we're like, ah, okay, what are we going to do about that? Well, coincidentally, that spring, Mama Raccoon found a den site underneath there, moved in, and we no longer had a rat problem. We waited till Mama had raised her babies. We sealed up how she was getting in and closed off the den site. No more rats. No raccoons after we sealed it up and the problem was solved. So that's really what raccoons are doing wandering around your neighborhood. Is they're looking for rodents. They of course are also looking for garbage. That is a delicious thing. What we throw away is what other animals consider to be delicious food. You look at that compost bin, there's asparagus in there, you know. And so garbage is gonna be an attractant. And here's the thing, it's our job to make sure that that attractant is not available to wildlife. So it might take an extra step, put that heavy bungee cord on. It might require you to tie your garbage bin up to the fence so that the animals don't knock it over. It might mean that you put your garbage out in the morning instead of putting it out at night. But that is, these are all ways that you can mitigate the attraction of garbage. And once the food source is no longer available, the animals are not going to come back. Uh, digging up lawns is another one. They're actually going after grubs if they're digging up your lawn, and there are several methods that you can do to decrease that, including putting beneficial nematodes on your lawn and changing your watering schedule. If you water at night normally and you change it to watering in the morning, it means the grubs are less active and the raccoons are going to be less likely to tear up your lawn. Again, WildCare's hotline number is on there and you can certainly give us a call and we can walk you through solving those problems. And then of course, using your property as a den site. And we're getting close to, we're already in skunk mating season and we're getting very close to raccoon mating season. So that means that if you are gonna look around your property and figure out where it might be a good den site and seal that up, you wanna make sure that you do that before we have babies coming in because you don't want to orphan families. You don't want to separate families for sure. Um, the skunks, of course, like as again, they are my absolute favorites. How could you not love those tiny baby skunks? And yes, they can spray when they're that young, but it's really something small and not a spray. Skunks eat rats and mice. They also eat slugs and snails. So if you have skunks moving through your yard, they are eating your slugs and your snails. And they are also taking care of things like crickets and cockroaches and stuff. And they are eating rats and mice. So that's what they're doing as they move through your yard. And here's the thing about skunks. Again, they have that one defense mechanism. They totally don't want to spray you. They have a limited amount of spray. It's not like they have unlimited spray. It's a limited amount of spray. Their body only generates a certain amount. And they don't want to use it on you. So they give you lots of warnings, stamping their feet, waving their tails, all that. The problem is that dogs don't understand skunk body language. We see this a lot. 
dogs think a tail up is an invitation to sniff. And so that is why so many dogs get sprayed. So we really recommend if you know you have skunks in the area, again, providing free slug snail and rodent control, you want to let them know that you're letting your dog out. Give the skunk some time to leave. Let them know, flash the light, come out and say, Mr. Skunk, we're letting the dog out. Give him some warning. And the skunks doesn't want to mess with you, doesn't want to mess with your dog and is gonna trundle off and no harm will be done. Again, you can call us and we can give you some more information about that. Um, some of the reasons they come into the wildlife hospital, uh, skunks often get caught in rat traps because they are going after the rodents that the traps are trying to get. Hit by car, uh, a lot of orphans coming in as well. Sorry, I'm gonna kind of move quickly. I keep looking at my clock. I'm like, oh no, I only have eight minutes. Um, the gray foxes are another one that we hear a lot of comments on. Gray foxes are amazing animals. They're one of the few canids that can climb trees. And apparently they love patio furniture. I find it hilarious how many people call up and say, we have weird little gray animals and they're playing on our patio furniture. So uh, the gray foxes are beautiful. They're amazing. They are very cat-like, but they are canids and they are also providing free rodent control for you. And then I wanted to get to coyotes because of course a lot of people have questions about coyotes. And um, you know, coyotes live among us and they are here and they we treat them in the wildlife hospital. You can see the one has a bandaged leg. Most of the time they come in hit by car. That's the most common reason that we get coyote patients in. Every once in a while we'll get a baby as young as the one that's drinking out of the bottle right there. But living with coyotes can certainly be a challenge. The first thing I want to do is I want to reassure you that the vast majority of a coyote's diet is also rodents. That has also been done with scat sampling. And here's the thing about coyotes. They provide an amazing service in, in that rodent control. And so you see, um, you'll have a larger number of rodents in areas where you don't have coyotes. And you will also have less variety of rodents. So you're gonna have fewer species of rodents and more dominant, probably your roof rat or your Norwegian rat or one of the animals that uh, maybe you don't want. Uh, the coyotes really do provide that balance. Another reason to like coyotes is that they do a lot of predation on the nests of animals like Canada geese and turkeys. So if you were to completely eliminate all of the coyotes in your area, if you're already worried about turkeys, the coyotes are going to, not having coyotes would mean that you would have a significant increase in that population. They really do a lot of predation on those turkey and Canada geese nests. Um, the best way to deal with the coyote is to see him and walk away. Most of the behavior that you're seeing coyotes do is because that animal wants you to leave him alone. They don't want to interact with us unless they've been fed, never feed them, and they want to be left alone. So, and they also have, the, the one of the main problems with coyotes is, is of course with our dogs because they see larger dogs as a threat and they potentially see larger, smaller dogs as prey. And that's just, you know, that's how their, their minds work. So the number one thing that we recommend is if you see a coyote, walk the other way. If you have a small dog with you, pick up your small dog and walk the other way. Anytime the coyote is showing himself to you, he's pretty much saying, hey, this is my area, please leave. And the way to avoid any sort of interaction is to just walk away. You can do things like shout and yell, although the coyotes do kind of get used to that, especially urban coyotes. Uh, the pennies in a can, uh, you put some pennies in a can and you shake it really loudly. Most wild animals will run away at that. And I think the coyotes don't like it either. So you can do that. But the best possible thing you can do is to walk away, turn and move away from that coyote's area. And um, the two of you can live in harmony and he can continue eating your rodents. Um, I'm sure people have more questions and we can talk about those as we, as we move along. Um, you'll notice the theme along all of these animals that are considered probably our number one nuisances are that they eat rodents. I love, I was going to go into these pictures, but uh, I don't really have time. Uh, the baby squirrel and the baby rat, both of these animals are in the wildlife hospital and both of them are about 14 days old. 
And I love the unbelievable difference between the incredibly underdeveloped baby squirrel. I mean, his eyes aren't gonna open for another two weeks. And that baby rat, fully furred, fully functional. Um, he, his eyes are still closed. So he is uh, still young, he's still very much a baby, but uh, isn't that interesting, the comparison between those two, the, the squirrel and the roof rat. Um, but uh, controlling rod rodents and keeping rodents down in your area is going to be the best way to keep other food sources as well, but to keep nuisance animal situations from happening. So eliminating those food sources. Things like ivy are, I didn't know this until I worked at Wild Care, that things like ivy are very attractive to rodents because they can run underneath the leaves, any sort of ground cover like that, and they can run underneath the leaves and they can make... Um, you know, be safe from predators. So removing ground cover close to your home, if you have ivy on your home, that's also going to be attractive to rodents. Removing that is going to help them not be part of your environment. Excluding them, obviously never using poison. Um, if you have the right property, hungry owl, uh, barn owls can be a help. Um, catch and relief, release traps inside. And if you need to do lethal methods, snap traps are what we would recommend. But really when it comes down to it, if you take away what is attracting them, seal up the ways that they're getting in, take away the food sources that are drawing them, you will successfully get rid of those rodents without having to use lethal methods. Um, Bird feeders are a big source of attracting rodents, and it's kind of into uh, the main thing to control that is rodents are, I mean, they're active at all times of day and night, but when it comes down to it, they probably prefer to be out at night or at least at dusk and dawn. And sweeping up the seed underneath your bird feeder every night, every single night, is going to be a great way to keep the number of rodents that come visiting, uh, going to keep that down. So making sure you clean up every single night. If you see rodents, take down those bird feeders because they are going to attract other wildlife to your property. Uh, the bird feeder thing is a really interesting thing at Wild Care. We, uh, we've, you know, our, our official policy is don't feed wildlife. Full stop. Done. But one thing I love about the organization is that we also recognize that everybody is going to feed the birds, right? Like my parents feed the birds, their favorite thing. And so, and I would never be able to convince them to stop. So what we do is don't feed wildlife, don't feed birds, but if you are going to feed birds, here's how to do it correctly. You need to disinfect your feeders every two weeks. Uh, they have two sets of feeders. They put one out, clean the other, put the other one out once that, you know, when that's clean, I'm starting to run out of time here, but you want to do a nine to one bleach to water solution. So nine parts water to one part bleach. And you want to do that every two weeks. If you hear that there are sick birds, sign up for Wild Care's email list. If you hear, I will let you know. If there are birds coming in with salmonella poisoning, mycoplasmosis, any of those other things, you must take your bird feeders down and not put them up again until you hear that it's all clear. Bird feeders are a huge vector for spreading disease between animals. If you keep them clean, that can be mitigated, but you have to keep them clean. So that's, that's our warning. Sweep up the seed every night, bleach them every two weeks. And if you're using feed, uh, hummingbird feeders, don't use bleach and also uh, clean them more often. Uh, the hummingbird, as soon as you see any cloudiness in that, in that uh, sugar solution, it means that the solution's going bad. So you need to change that, clean the feeder and bleach it. So how to feed birds, even though we don't actually recommend it. Um, I'm gonna just whiz through this because I want to get uh, oh yeah, other ways to help songbirds, keeping kitties indoors and preventing window strikes. Again, visiting WildCare's website, discoverwildcare.org. We have lots of information on both of these topics and a great way to prevent harm to songbirds. Um, again, about 11% of the patients that come into wild care come in because they were caught by domestic cats. And uh, my kitty was just coming in and out from her catio. We have a protected catio that she can't get out of, but she does get some sun, so that's a really good option. And the birds be safe collar is one that we do recommend if you have a cat that simply cannot be kept inside. And, and I know that sometimes happens, in which case you should decide that your next cat will be an indoor only cat. But the birds be safe collar kind of looks like a clown collar. It's very brightly colored. There's really nothing more fun than making your cat look silly. And that's one of the ways that you can do it, but it also protects songbirds. The songbirds see that bright color. 
Um, hitting windows is another way. Those UV stickers do work. You have to replace them though every couple of months. Do visit our website and you can get some more information on both of those. And of course, not trimming trees and bushes during the spring and summer months when animals are using them as nests. And we're gonna be doing a big campaign again, the Respect the Nest campaign with our wonderful graphic by the artist, Michael Schwab. We're gonna be doing that campaign again this year to remind people to not do non-emergency tree work or garden work or shrub work anything that you're doing in your yard that can disrupt to the baby animals that are nesting. And, and that's starting soon, you know, starting in, I mean, in Marin, it's going to start in mid-February. We might get baby squirrels in the next week or so. Uh, usually get our first baby birds in March and April, but uh, the nesting season is indeed starting. So we're going to just whiz through this. I know we need to get to our question answer. Oh yeah, other potential conflicts. Oh, see, I could just talk all day. Um, how you can help wildlife, creating a wildlife friendly habitat is a great way to do that. And interestingly, leaving piles of wood or piles of leaves or you know things that would be considered detritus by us make great, great habitat. I moved a bin the other day and there were a whole bunch of slender salamanders under it. I felt terrible for moving their home. So leaving you know, things that you know we would consider detritus and need to be cleaned up, but leaving those things can provide great habitat for wildlife. Um, doing things like looking for den sites before baby season. So right now is about your last opportunity for that. Keeping pets indoors, not feeding them outside, talking to friends and neighbors about the unintended consequences of feeding, teaching children how to respect and appreciate wildlife. We're gonna be opening up wild care summer wildlife camps very soon. If you have young children that love animals, great opportunity to interact and keeping animals at a distance. Of course, wild animals are always going to be better off if they are separate from our, our influence in every way. Uh, so that's a few ways to help wildlife. How can you help wild care? Of course, donating is always appreciated. Again, we're almost entirely supported by private donations from people just like yourselves. Volunteering, we have some great volunteer opportunities available. If you go to our website, discoverwildcare.org forward slash volunteer. Uh, volunteering in the wildlife hospital, volunteering as a nature guide, taking children on hikes, amazing opportunity, and also our internships in the wildlife hospital are available. Um, I always have to mention letting us know about family foundations or other potential funders that are interested in supporting organizations that do nature education or care for animals. And finally, visiting us in San Rafael. If you go to our website, you can see the hours that we're open to the public. We are open nine to five, seven days a week to accept animal patients, but we are open to the public for just visiting on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturday mornings. And you can find us online again at discoverwildcare.org for that information. Mary, you're back. That must mean it's time to do question and answer. Yes, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm going to the first question. Can you see me? Okay. I can see you, yeah. Good. Okay, we got quite a few questions. Um, first is, is it true that trapped animals cannot be relocated and released, or are they skunks, possums, raccoons, et cetera, euthanized by local services? Yeah, it is absolutely true. It is illegal to, rel to relocate animals in California, and that's because, I mentioned this a little earlier, but it's because most of the time those animals die. You're putting them in an unfamiliar place where they don't know where the food is, don't know where the shelter is, and they get beat up by the animals that are already there. So it's illegal in California, and that is very true that some of the trapping services will say, oh, we're just going to relocate him. They're not legally allowed to do that. So yes, they do actually end up euthanizing them. So that's why we want you to do preventative things that prevent you having to trap. Mary, you want me to read the next one? Sure, go ahead. Awesome, yeah. So do we have a good question? Do we have enough volunteers to care for our patients during COVID? Uh, that's one of the reasons we're recruiting right now is that uh, we're expanding our group a little bit. Uh, the first year, 2020 was 
hard, let me tell you, with almost no volunteers. And then our incredibly dedicated team of volunteers have come back and they, um, we don't have as many and we've adjusted the program a little bit. So right now we're okay with the need for a few more. So visit discoverwildcare.org forward slash volunteer and uh, get involved. We'd love to have you join us, but yeah, it's been a challenge. Um, another question, black rat poison boxes have become very prevalent in Mill Valley. The priority of the local health inspector is to keep rats away from human populations. Do you think that anything can be done on a government level to change this method of controlling rodents? Excellent question and kind of a big one. Um, the, so the first thing is that those boxes do not always mean poison. Uh, a lot of the time they do, they do, and most of the time they probably do, but you also use those boxes if they, you just use snap traps. So like County of Marin, for instance, has an IPM policy, integrated pest management policy, which means that they don't use poisons, but they still have the boxes because the traps are in there and, and the boxes prevent, ideally prevent animals like skunks from being trapped. So it may not always be poison. It probably is poison. Um, it's interesting because wild care has worked very, very hard to, um, get the use of the anticoagulant rat poisons. So um, like decon is, is an example, the, the, the ones that cause internal bleeding uh, to get those rodenticides outlawed because those rodenticides do travel up the food chain. And, and we did testing for many, many, many years that showed that if a hawk or an owl or a raccoon or a skunk eats a poisoned rat, that animal gets poisoned as well. And there have been great strides in California and to a certain degree at the EPA level to make those poisons not available. Currently, it's it's not legal to use those anticoagulant poisons. The problem is that there are other options out there, including a poison called bromethylin, that in it doesn't as easily travel up the food chain, although it does, and it um, but there's no antidote for it. So in some ways, it's worse. So I think um, letting your local government know that you want them to use IPM, integrated pest management, not use poison. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a bigger discussion. Uh, you're, welcome to, you're welcome to check in with us. You can uh, call Wild Care and we can, we can get you that information. Um, let's see, Sierra, all right, is there any legislation in the works oh, to stop the use of rat poison? I have neighbors that refuse to stop using it. Interesting, interestingly, Sierra, they, uh, the, Anticoagulant poisons are currently illegal for personal use. Um, the, there are a few exceptions for uh, pest control operators, but even the pest control operators, as of right now, are not supposed to be using it. But people can buy it on Amazon. They can end up, um, you know, there's still a lot of people that use it. And I, I think, you know, the fact that it is illegal and it is harder to get is at least a start. But uh, we do have some resources on our website and there's also another great website called Raptors Are The Solution. It's their acronym is RATS, raptorsarethesolution.org. And they have some great resources to help you maybe talk to your neighbors about why it's so dangerous to the environment. Um, you're welcome. Uh, Larry, I've heard that you can put up an owl box. It needs to be in an open or un unobstructed location. Yes. So uh, a couple of different species of owls. The great horn owls don't use boxes, so you can't attract them. But the screech owls uh, are okay in wooded areas. So if you live in a lot of marine neighborhoods, those are not going to be super user friendly for barn owls. Barn owls like a wide open field. So you'll see barn owl boxes in Novato kind of in north that you'll have that wide open expanse. Uh, the other thing about the barn owl boxes in particular is that the owls are pretty noisy when you have a family of owls. So we have your, the box has to be like 40 feet at least away from a habitation. And they do want that wide open expanse. So in most Marin neighborhoods, a barn owl box is probably going to attract squirrels more than it's going to attract barn owls. But if you live in a wooded area and uh, uh, using a screech owl box, you may well get a Western screech owl and they're super useful for road control too and they are they like the woodlands so that you know having a screech owl box means that he can be under the, the tree cover and so you can look into that again hungryowls.org is the hungry owl project direct website and you can purchase both of those there um here and then a couple uh i don't know i said hours i'm not sure if that means owls or Sorry. Oh, I, oh, Julie has a question. Uh, sorry, I, if you want to 
Let's see. Wild Care does a great job educating the public about living with wildlife. I'd love to see a change of language to animal and non-human animals are similar because by referring to humans and animals separately, the disconnect with the rest of nature and hierarchical, as hierarchical aspect of humans as a higher being in control of non-human animals is continued. That is a fascinating point, Julie. Um, something for us to look at. I assume I can keep this chat. I'm going to pass that along to our education department. Uh, Barbara asks, what do you do about bats that come into the house? The number one thing you do is call for help and you want to call Marin Humane for that if you live in Marin County. A bat in the house is actually an emergency because they can, they can carry rabies, not hugely likely, but um, they, and they can also bite people when they're sleeping and that become, that can be a real health, health risk. So you want to stay out of the room where the bat is and again, call for assistance. Uh, if it's a room you can stay out of, you uh, want, you, you can open windows, you can make it possible for that animal to get out, but definitely call Wild Care 456-SAVE, uh, 456-7283 or um, you are calling Marin Humane, but definitely you wanna get that animal out of the house as fast as possible. Uh, Jerry, what about coyotes in our backyards? They are after cats and small dogs. Well, to a certain degree, yes. So a, a coyote will take a, a cat or a small dog if the opportunity presents. But again, the majority of what they're looking for is rodents. So they're not necessarily there to prey on our cats and dogs. They're also looking for the things like fallen fruit or pet food that's left outside. Um, they're looking for all of those food sources. So 100%, we strongly, strongly in every way recommend keeping kitties indoors. Um, takes them out of the food chain, also better for all the wildlife. Um, being very, very careful about your small dog. I mean, that's an animal that you need to be responsible for, so never letting him out without uh, supervision. Um, and making sure you don't have other things and, and your neighbors don't have other things like a bird feeder attracting rodents, fallen fruit, pet, pet food outside, that type of thing that's going to um, attract more coyotes. Uh, but you can call our hotline 456-7283 and they can help you with some more solutions for that. There's this wonderful thing called a coyote roller that you put on your fence and the coyote jumps up and it poosh, rolls it roll and, and he's not able to actually jump in. So if you have a fenced yard, that can be a good way to keep them and other animals out. Um, generations of uh, skunks, raccoons and possums had to trap a pair of skunks in one raccoon. Um, so the foundation, the lack of a house without a foundation, that's a challenging one. I would recommend calling uh, our hotline 415-456-7283 and they can direct you towards some resources because you, you are gonna need to get that sealed. And I actually don't know how to do that with a foundation, but there are smart people that do. So I would recommend uh, talking, uh, giving us a call and I think we can get you some resources. Um, Blythedale Ridge and Mill Valley, we're having an influx of voles. Interesting, decimated my flowers and even citrus. Suggestions on how to deal, isn't that interesting? So I find it fascinating how you have predator and prey cycles. So a big number of rodents means that the next year you're probably going to have a larger number of predator animals born. It really does go in a wave, it's fascinating. So you're not likely to have multiple years of vole problems. Although one thing I will say is that the distemper epidemic that we have seen hitting primarily skunks, raccoons, and foxes does mean that there are fewer of those predators. And so you do have an increase in rodents like voles coming in. Um, a couple of things that you can do for that. One thing that in, your, in a whole yard, it's a little bit challenging. Again, call us because our front desk team has great advice on all of these things. Um, certainly uh, commercial rodent repellents can have some efficacy. The one thing that I have seen that works, especially on citrus is, and this is gross, used cat litter. Animals don't like used cat litter. It smells like a predator to them makes sense. I would offer you mine. I have a kitten. Uh, but if you know someone that has a kitty, um, that can be a good thing. I, that's how I successfully deterred a, a gopher from underneath my rose bushes was just putting some used litter in there every couple of days. So that is an option. And check in again, our hotline 415-456-7283. Um, 
What about gardens that have food that many animals like to eat, such as tomatoes? Um, animal I've been told it was a bull girdled one of my citrus tree and the tree and that tree almost died. The rodents really can be a challenge and I and I certainly do understand that. Um, and with the voles, again, you're going to see cycles in that population. So if you're having a lot of problems with voles last season, there is a good chance you're not going to have as much of a problem with voles next season. Something like, depending on where you are, either putting up a barn owl box or putting up a screech owl box might well be a good opportunity for you. And that would be a natural predator that could help with that. Um, again, cat litter can sometimes help. Uh, the, the rodent exclusion products that you can buy can kind of help. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get through things, but again, give a call to Wild Care and our, and our team can probably give you some better ideas. Um, Dead or damaged trees are necessary for bird homes and food storage. Can this be brought to the public's attention somehow? Yeah, that ties in with my very brief comment at the end there where I was uh, talking about leaving things that look like detritus to us, right? If you have a dead tree that is not going to be, it does, it's not a threat to your home or your car or whatever, if you can leave that, that would be amazing. That is great habitat for all kinds of wildlife. Dead trees really do provide a tremendous source of habitat and food for a lot of animals. So if you're able to leave those, that's wonderful. Uh, let's see. So we talked to Larry, a couple of hours here in the, do you mean owls? Not sure. We are blessed with a family of owls in our neighborhood that provides a nightly symphony of hoot echoes in the canyon. Do owls migrate? And if so, do they return to the same nest every year? So the short answer is that some owls migrate, and I find that so interesting, especially in Marin County. I don't migrate. I love it here. So a lot of the birds don't either. And the owls in general, I, you know, I actually don't know the answer to that question. If great horned owls migrate and where they go, if they do, they don't go terribly far, but they do return to the nest sites. So that's actually something for me to research, but they do come back to the same nest site. So certainly if you have a great nesting tree that has a nest in it, you're probably going to have that same pair of great horned owls coming back again. Uh, what do you do when you find injured wildlife after wild care patient intake hours? Such a good question. So we do have a wonderful team of volunteers that answer our hotline after hours. So we have the after hours hotline from 5 to 9 p.m. and they can give you advice. Generally, the advice if we are not yet open is that you, you can do this, I promise, take the animal, put them in the right size box or kennel or container with a towel or something, keep it covered, keep it quiet, keep it warm, don't peek at it and bring it to us in the morning. I know that sounds hard and I know that sounds scary, but we have people do it all the time. So that, and that will generally be the advice that you get is take the animal, make sure he or she is in the, you know, in a box contained, Put them in a quiet place. If you have a heating pad, you can put a heating pad under the box, but you only want to put half of the box on the heating pad because overheating is as dangerous as underheating. Put the heating pad on low, put them in a room that no one's going to go into, and then bring them to us in the morning. Can we legislate so that Amazon cannot sell rat poisons? Oh, there are so many things that I wish I could do with Amazon. That is an excellent <laughs> question. We'll see what we'll, we're working on that. I'm also, our next campaign is going to be against the use of glue traps, which are absolutely heinously, hideously horrible. And I want to get those out of all stores and Amazon also. So I'll keep you updated with that. Uh, is the population of barn owls lower due to poison? That's interesting. It depends on where you are, if your population is high or low, but certainly we see a large number of barn owls coming in with the anticoagulant poisoning. So it's a real risk to them. Uh, interestingly, there was a study done by a group that works with our Hungry Owl Project that is seeing a huge increase in the number of barn owls in the East Bay, and I believe a decrease in Marin County, and not exactly sure what the correlation is there. But yes, it absolutely ha can have a uh, population level impact. So never, ever, ever use poison for anything. Are you seeing a severe decline in bird populations in Marin? That's an interesting question. Uh, the short answer is no. We're seeing the same number of patients coming into the wildlife hospital. I'd be curious what you're seeing. Um, 
so I, I feel like the birds in my neighborhood have been consistent. It, it may be related to changes in the, you know, your neighborhood in particular. Um, that's an interesting question, but as far as wildlife hospital intake, we've seen the same number and we're seeing the same species diversity. So we're not, but you know, again, we're only looking at 35 to 100, 3,500 to 4,000 animals. So we're not really, it's not really a scientific sample, but that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, we had over 20 turkeys in our yard in Tiburon for a few hours and then they left. Where do they come from? Well, they come from everywhere. Turkeys are an ongoing problem that I know many are uh, many people are dealing with. Again, your coyotes are helping keep the turkey populations in check, something to think about. But um, they are very social animals. They're very smart animals. They are very, uh, you know, they have big territories and they wander around looking for food. And if you saw them, you had 20 and you saw them and they left, then I think consider yourself lucky because the, um, we have a, a number of people that have problems with them roosting on their roof. Uh, if you see them, don't want them there, one of the best ways to deter turkeys from any location is actually to use what's called a scarecrow sprinkler. And the scarecrow sprinkler is great for deer also. It is a motion activated sprinkler. And I had a, a person I talked to that put their motion activated sprinkler on the roof of their house. And when the turkeys landed, what it does is it sends this absolutely heart stopping jet of water that will, I mean, I've nearly had a heart attack every time I've walked past mine when I forgot to turn it off, but it sends this jet of water. Any wild animal in the vicinity just goes, what the heck, and flees. So that can be a really good option. And not to promote Amazon, actually go to your local hardware store and ask them for the scarecrow sprinkler. And that can be an option for turkeys. Um, kind of a quick answer there, sorry. I had a rat problem with my citrus trees. The only way I've been able to solve it was using netting around the bottom. Okay, this is sort of the reverse of using netting at the top of the tree to keep away birds. I'm not sure the, where the rats are feeding now, but my citrus is safe. It's a really good point. So you can also use the flashing, that metal flashing. If you can make it so the animals can't get into your tree, then you are definitely, I'm thinking about my lemon tree, which is like that tall. So like it totally would not help me with flashing. But uh, if you have an actual lemon tree, that's a really good point. Be really careful with netting though, that it is rolled up off the ground to allow reptiles, um, snakes especially to move underneath. Snakes are also providing free rodent control. And we get dozens of snakes, if not, I mean, almost a hundred snakes every single year tangled up in garden netting. And so what, if you have to use netting, make sure it's not trailing on the ground because the animals get caught in it and then they get all snarled up in it. So um, great suggestion and um, just make sure that it's off the ground and allows those rodent predators to move around underneath. Uh, great, you know, great. One more, can I do one more quick one? Okay. Yeah, and do you know any wild care services in the Sacramento and I haven't Sacramento area I haven't seen anything on Google I have a family of raccoons under my Sacramento house and despite evacuating them and sealing they came back I love them and I don't want them to be harmed. Um, Sierra I'm trying to think so there's a couple of options up in Tahoe and there is um, the one in Auburn. <sighs> I cannot remember the name of it right now. Do a search for Auburn Wildlife Center and I think you will find it. Everybody, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Allison. That was a terrific presentation. We learned so much. And I think I think we should all go to the Discover Wild Care uh, e newsletter. Yes. I write most of it. So you get a lot of stuff from me when you when you go to the when you get our emails. So great. Well, I'm enthusiastic. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Our next webinar will be on February 24th. The speaker will be Sarah Matson, uh, Development Director for San Rafael's Canal Alliance. Canal Alliance is the only provider of affordable and comprehensive immigration legal services in Marin County. They help Latino immigrants overcome the generational cycle of poverty. She will share how the Alliance addresses the many financial and health issues that have come up during the pandemic. You can register for the
webinar by going to our website under public events. Thanks again. Hope to see you next time.